Kia ora and welcome to the programme. You're watching GREC, the Government Regulatory Practice Initiative. My name's Ian Kaplan and this is episode three in a series of seven webinars which taken together form the 2021 annual GREC conference. We also throw in five films as well, more on that later members of the audience, on the topic taken together, all 12 items, on conversations. Conversations that help regulatory practice and regulatory stewardship. For those of you new to us, GREG is the world's first professional capability network across government based here in New Zealand. Our audience is primarily based in New Zealand, but you may also be internationally based and increasingly are. We're recording at the moment, we're recording live. Uh, we will go out with a box set of these webinars in December, closer to Christmas shopping deadlines. And so wherever and indeed whenever you're watching us, you're very welcome here. I mentioned the films. The films are already on the subject of conversations being progressively released and you can find them on the GREG website. Conversations between regulatory and policy practitioners, conversations involving stakeholders and tonight conversations with local and central government and well-being one coming across next week and other things to follow. Do take a look at the GREG website for much more than that. We're talking today about international digital conversations. We're having those international digital conversations. And it's very much part of the case of this conference, members of the audience, that we want you to be part of a conversation. There are no PowerPoints here. It's just talk, rational and hopefully very helpful talk. And we get you involved. If you have something to say, if you have a question to ask or a comment to make, use the Q&A function, please, and we'll get to you. We're going to warm you up now, members of the audience, by giving you a poll. And we've used the word conversations already, but what's it worth? That is in Scrabble terms. Our prologue poll is coming up now. What do you reckon it's worth? And don't be too clever. There's no triple word scores or double word or double letter scores involved. Just a raw net score. This does become interesting. OK, I think the polls are settling down. Just give you a few more seconds, members of the audience. OK, and we're at, I think we're at 35. I don't think we'll need any Supreme Court interventions on this one. The answer, in fact, was 18. So well done. Now, we're looking at Scrabble. We're also looking at Monopoly, another board game. And believe it or not, at this time of year in the United States, um, it is National Let's Play Monopoly Day. Monopoly is, of course, another board game, probably close institutionally to at least one of our uh, guest speakers' hearts, uh, regulating monopolies in, in part from the Commerce Commission. Um, but in a sense, we're all in the business of international digital regulation or domestic regulation concerned about monopoly. That's because we're custodians of the community chest, don't want to leave anything to chance, want to let fair markets thrive and let people pass, go and collect, but are not in the business of giving people a get out of jail free card. And the difficulties that are faced are no less in terms of the challenges of international digitalization for regulators. And as you can see from, I think, probably um, one of the more highly wrought backing screens for, um, for a number of us today, you can see what exactly they do. So I'm pleased to introduce Antonia Horrocks, who is from the Commerce Commission, and she is the general manager of competition. David Chanks is the chief censor, and you can see his cool movie pictures behind him. But I think Dave Robson takes, uh, takes something of a lead, in, at least in terms of overtness, because he's a director gambling at DIA. A very warm welcome to you all, colleagues. It's lovely to have you here. Uh, do dive in, as I say, members of the audience with questions and comments. But I'm going to just kick off first. And, and I'm going to start, Dave, with you, if I may. But all of us uh, jump in from time to time. The international, or rather the internet based international digital economy. And I'm thinking of digital harm and I'm thinking of gambling here. You've got basically no physical barriers to dealing unless you switch off the internet in, in, in full or in part. You've got pretty minimal entry criteria to, to market. How do you even begin with the tools that you've got in the context of gambling to deal with harm prevention? Thanks, Ian. Yeah, and look, I'll talk firstly about the context about how New Zealand currently regulates. And so for us, it's very much around um, traditional land-based gam gambling. So gam um, regulating in the bricks and mortar sense. So seeing people, seeing them gamble, watching their behaviors. Um, 
but actually it's, the question we have is around the traditional gambling regulation versus the digital gambling regulation, um, which is also a context of heavily regulated traditional gambling to what is either unregulated or lightly regulated international gambling. Regulating gambling is very much um, based on human behaviours and watching those human behaviours, seeing those human behaviours. But when someone's at the end of a computer or a phone at the other side of the world, uh, it creates some really big challenges um, to actually how you regulate. Um, to complicate that even more, there's what we call a convergence of gambling. So digital gambling um, and traditional gambling merging. Um, so sometimes we have um, electronic gambling next to physical machines. Sometimes we have physical um, virtual reality, um, you know, providing what seems like a physical gambling presence in a digital world. So the, the experiences that the users have um, is not what we see, think is traditional gambling. So we've got to th have a think about what's our, what's our understanding of their um, experiences, but actually what are they actually experiencing? Um, because the harm's the same. Um, COVID's driving a lot of these market changes. So yeah. because people are locked away in their homes, um, they're, they're being not forced, but they've driven quite quickly towards these um, digital and online presence. Um, and so a lot of our traditional gambling uh, organisations are actually following the market and following the money and actually setting up an online presence. So, for example, Sky City uh, Casino, um, they have the very big on, um, physical presence in Auckland, Hamilton and Queenstown, but actually they've opened up an online uh, casino based in Malta. So it's offshore, it's allowed. Uh, so they're actually, they, they're managing, they're in the two markets now, so they're in the physical gambling market and also the digital. Um, so that's really um, a disruptor for regulation. People are exposed not just domestically, but internationally to gambling and the different types of harm and forms of harm that's presented. So um, for us as a gambling regulator, we've got some pretty good data about uh, the amount of money that goes into gambling and the profits that are made both domestically and internationally. Yeah. But actually about the harms, that's the hard part. So we really don't have much visibility of the harms, both domestically but internationally. Um, we just can't see it. And let's just pause there. Thank you for that, Dave, because I can see David nodding quite vigorously there. In terms of harm, in terms of the harms that you you have to deal with, and I can see um, from your wall the harms potentially you have to look for. What are the international harms in the context in which you operate, and what are the tools that you've got, and how dated might they be? Um, Morena, and thanks, Ian. Look, um, I think you said briefly what are the international harms in my context as a media regulator um, aimed at uh, reducing or preventing harm to New Zealanders from content. Um, it doesn't take much imagination to see that in terms of a globally connected, uh, digitally driven world, the, the scope of harm is enormous and broad. And the sorts of harms we're talking about are a terrorist extremist content, um, degrading, uh, dehumanizing material, child sexual abuse material, bomb making and drug making guides, on and on and on. Yeah. Um, we know all of this is out there. Um, in terms of the the toolkit I have to to manage that as a as a content and media regulator, I'm based on a, a piece of 1993 legislation in this country which uh, is starting to look a little bit past its best before date at this point in time. But uh, I would say that the sorts of harms that we're dealing with now in the internet uh, content and media environment, most of them existed in 1993. Um, we, we had this sort of material, we had uh, harmful terrorist extremist material, we had abusive material, um, but we didn't have the amplification factors that the internet provides. We didn't have the global reach and scope, and we didn't have the, uh, the, the, the technological bases for exploitation that we're seeing today. Um, in terms of how the, the toolkit can be applied from essentially a pre-internet piece of regulation to today's context, there, there's one very interesting aspect of, uh, of the regulation, the Classification Act in New Zealand, where... I, as Chief Censor, can reach out and call in and classify any piece of content that I think might be presenting a harm to the New Zealand public, which by virtue of the definitions in the Classification Act 
effectively includes any digital artifact, any web page, any tweet, any uh, any TikTok video. Yeah. Now that's interesting, isn't it? But um, it's really just a, a, a shovel or a hand trowel when faced with a Mount Everest of uh, harmful content. So the question is, how can you apply that for maximum effect? And uh, that's obviously challenging, but at least it provides a platform for a conversation with platforms who are managing this sort of content. The other thing that I would mention briefly is that under the Classification Act, um, my office has a mandate to undertake research. So when, for example, we're grappling with the issue of mis- and disinformation, which is obviously a clear and present uh, issue here and overseas, um, we do, we can and do conduct research to unpack the problem and put it in the public domain. I'll just mm -hmm. do a plug for a, a research report that we released earlier this year. Oh, bye. Um, at the edge of the infodemic, where we yep. conducted a, a, a national survey of New Zealanders on mis and disinformation, how they felt about it, their, their rate of uh, experience of it, uh, what they did in response to it, and potentially mapping out some of the responses that the system yep. could apply to that. So there are things that can be done. It's very challenging. And it's and, and we'll, we'll hold that, David, and it's stretching the envelope potentially. And I mean, having a shovel to approach base camp and getting those relationships right. I mean, Antonio, in the massive amount of things that you institutionally regulate, how have you found relationships, both domestic and international, in shaping your approach to the regulated areas you look at? Thanks, Ian. I mean, it's a really good question, and I think it's just so critical. Um, coming to today, I was reflecting on the fact regulators everywhere, domestically and globally, are really facing significant changes with economic, technological, social change at speed, not to mention the climate change challenge. Um, and I mean, we are having these discussions in multiple fora, um, APEC, across the ASEAN region, with our competition and regulation colleagues and domestically. And, and I think for those of us that have um, tools that go right across markets, and when we're thinking about competition and fair trading, we have to look at whether there are harms to the entire economy in relation to those tools. So dialogue with other regulators is critical to understand and prioritise the harms. And I think thinking about all of the different fora we uh, um, have been engaged in this year, a few key themes for regulators come out. Curiosity and understanding. Um, be curious, ask the questions, ask them of the private sector, ask them of your co-regulators so we can all understand what those harms are and where the focus should be. Um, communication and then coordination. And I think those are the things I see as, as really essential to the delivery of well-targeted regulative solutions. Um, I think in the digital space, a lot of what I'd probably call wicked problems are arising um, where no one specific enforcement or advocacy tools are going to be um, the, um, sufficient to address the entirety of the issue. Um, in the digital space, um, market power questions come up quite a lot. Um, and there is a Commerce Amendment Bill before Parliament, which seeks to change our market power test, um, which personally think will help in that space. But really, there are privacy, tax, security and democracy issues arising, which are well outside, um, you know, what a competition or consumer focus can do. And I think in thinking about how to go into those discussions, everyone's domestic context is different. Yeah. Um, you know, in New Zealand, um, for us um, uh, as an independent crown entity, starting to think about, um, you know, with uh, treaty obligations under the Treaty of Waitangi, what is the starting point there? Why does that make it different um, entering into these discussions from a New Zealand perspective? Where is our consumer understanding? Where is our business understanding of actually some of the digital issues so that we can make sure we're proposing the right type of solutions, but also prioritising the right type of harms? So I think dialogue is really important. Working with others is, is really important. But there's also an investment piece, and I think that's where sometimes um, as a small jurisdiction working with our offshore counterparts can be really useful. Um, 
I was interested to hear um, David mention surveys. You know, we can actually utilize technology um, and survey our counterparts more, understand the issues that are going on. We can talk about what works and what doesn't and actually test things. And I think the one thing as regulators that's critical for us all is to um, be very aware that that means developing um, the greatest asset of all regulators, which is our people. And yep. so um, starting to think about um, what that means differently in a digital environment in terms of learning and development, accessing much um, greater sets of information, and then bringing that all back to focus on what should be prioritised between us and keeping that dialogue quite open across government, I think is... Yep. The way forward for us yeah and absolutely antonio thank you for that and it is about conversations it is i think i'm detecting from all three of you it's about co-regulation co domestically even in the international frame that charity begins at home if i can put it that way and i can see some nods there let's go to the audience um i can see already and you've all already clocked this one uh, members of the audience you you vote you get to vote you put thumbs up on the uh on the q a the things you want asked more in which case you know you can see me rocking around following it but it looks like it's settled it looks like the front runner is uh would love a link to david's research report there we are i've just provoked two extra votes can you share it here david can you share it here or where can it be found please oh somebody's found it lisa i think we found it um lisa doherty there um yep the link is there so members of the audience just pop into that link and uh you're away. Now, the next question we've got, there's a mountain of COVID related conspiracy and misinformation. And of course, it's Jermaine right now. I guess I guess starting with you, David, particularly in, in the kind of in terms of the powers that you're exercising or potentially exercising, uh, and it is controversial. Are there any best practices that we can look to overseas in this space as regulators looking at the mischief that this causes? In the context of mis and disinformation, generally, yes. No, there, are, there, are, there is no, no. best practice uh, roadmap or um, plan that I have seen anywhere in the world that uh, that we can leverage off. Having said that, everyone is grappling with this problem in real time at the same time. So I tell Toko what uh, um, Antonia said about leveraging international relationships so i'm certainly don't absolutely don't get me wrong i'm not saying that there isn't things that we can learn from in terms of the overseas experience and things that are being tried um, in this space absolutely there are the the thing is nobody has a mature evolved um uh, coordinated set of responses to it and this is a wicked problem this is a very, very complex problem that cuts to the heart of freedom of freedoms of speech, uh, the nature of democracy, uh, how how systems work. You know, it is not as we said in our research report. Um, if you think you can resolve this problem through a re regulatory mechanism prohibiting um, uh, uh, misinformed misinformation or or views that uh, that are problematic or just plain out false you are wrong because actually anything that involves a state coercive power applied to people's views and attitudes and beliefs um, is, is not resolved in that way. However, no. the interesting interface in the context of this discussion is that the major, most major responsible platforms do have in place policies and terms of use that apply to mis and disinformation themselves. They are applying a duty of care and that provides the basis for potentially a useful, significant discussion because we know those platforms are not applying those policies well or consistently or effectively. Let's just hold that there, David. Thank you for that. I just want to ask the audience, how are you feeling at the moment? This is a halftime popcorn poll. Uh, this is very much a new sort of format for us here at GREG. We think it works. We're going to put a poll out to see how you feel at the moment. And I think it's... Uh, it's not films, it's song titles. There we are. Are you more Farrell Williams or Joan Jett? You can work on that, members of the audience. I just want to pick up on something that, 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 that our guests have said. And it's also the sort of um, one of the front running questions. I think it just riffs off what David's been talking about. Um, the focus seems to be mainly on providers. What about flipping that? What about flipping it to education? Or am I just being naive? Dave Robson. 
Um, look, I think um, New Zealand is in a different position to a lot of other countries in terms of gambling and where um, we take a health focus and a harm focus. A lot of countries in their gambling regulation and the way that the gambling policy is set up is really purely for an economic um, policy. So actually a lot of the countries look at us um, around harm um, and we in New Zealand, um, the Ministry of Health are a co-regulator. Uh, so they, they're really big. They do the individual harm um, and the community harm sort of frontline work. So although we've got the policy settings and the support they need, actually um, from a harm perspective um, and target and making sure that individuals are educated, uh, understand how to identify harm, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge system um, that supports that. So that's a really great, um, it's a great position for New Zealand to be in there. Actually, we've taken that, that health system approach. Um, and I know that other countries do look to us for advice around that. But I guess the difficulty is, um, and, and going to you, Antonia, is, is there's a point at which presumably the regulated party um, doesn't want to be educated. They just want to deal. And they just want to know that um, they, can, they can basically be in a fair market that thrives and that the regulator will be there if things go wrong, however easy or hard that is to actually fulfil. Look, I, I mean, I think we, we think it's really important that um, there is sufficient information out there for business and consumers about the rules so that people can be confident when making purchasing decisions or when um, entering into markets. And we are a country of SME businesses. So that distinction between uh, when you are regulating between um, business and consumers is not actually um, very large often. Um, we did a significant ad campaign um, earlier in the year around our new um, cartel criminalization tool, very short, um, very targeted. And we really hope that that will raise awareness um, but certainly with some different groups and many of our regulatory areas apply to different groups. I think there's, it's really important um, that as part of the function, when you've got new tools, you have an education focus. Um, we've been doing a lot of work this year in relation to new rules around the credit contracts um, area and carried out huge lender seminars. I think on the consumer understanding piece, and I'm really speaking for one of my colleagues areas here, I mean, what we have found is, is there is a lot of confusion amongst consumers about what goes on in the digital space. There, there can be that same confusion um, in, in relation to businesses as well. I mean, how Google AdWords works is a, is a classic one for us. We've actually got a case before the High Court seeking declarations that a consumer loan provider engaged in cartel conduct relating to online advertising on Google Ads by reaching agreements with other consumer loan providers. I mean, we're seeking a declaration because we want to understand the law in that area. And that's, there are a couple of other countries globally that have looked at to the law in that area, but we're trying to lead by getting some clarity when you speak to businesses or consumers, understanding quite how Google runs its search listings, how its ad works, it's something we do every day, but it's not something everyone can explain. So there is a role for further education on some of the things that I think in a, in a non-digital world, we all know. We know the visual cues when we walk into a shop. We yeah. can tell whether a bricks and mortar premises is, is safe for us for a range of reasons, much harder in a digital space, and we're all learning. And I think there's a role for us as regulators to help with that. Absolutely. And I'm just picking up on that point and, and just picking up on the poll. I'm glad that most of you are uh, Farrell Williams and happy. Um, I, I, perhaps you too are, are dazed and confused by the lack of uh, legal certainty in some areas like Led Zeppelin. And I'm sorry if you're Joan Jett and frustrated, but um, some of you are even amused to death. And I'm, I'm glad that um, most of, or rather least of you are sad. One of the things that I would like to explore with this, because this is the government regulatory practice initiative, in terms of the education of those in the regulatory profession, which um, all of us watching give or take probably are, what are the kind of soft and harder skills that would help deal with these sorts of issues? And I guess the second limb of the question is, to what extent is it actually exactly the same for international and domestic forms of regulation? Are we talking the same currency? Um, Antonia, back to you, perhaps. Um, 
I, I think, um, I mean, we've been talking about this a lot internationally in relation to the COVID response. Yeah. And I think what we've all learned is, um, as, as I think Dave and David both said, you're in the life of the problem. No one's solved it. No one's got a perfect regulatory solution. But talking to each other about some of the ways to go is really helpful. Um, and there's that question of figuring out how to work at speed and needing to be experimental and knowing not all of those experiments will be successful. I think that that is a really important part of what we're all doing. Sorry, can you just repeat the bit of the question again? The yeah, sort of course. It's, we... it's, I think it's, it's the sort of soft skills that, that we need. And I guess the second bit, and I think you touched on that, and I think the second bit, and we can all jump in on this, and what do you think, members I think of the What audience? I would just say to the last bit of the soft skills, and the other part of that conversation has been yeah. the increasing need to, for advocacy um, to explain the rules we enforce. And um, each of us has a specific remit. Our tools don't go to everything. So yeah. when a wicked problem arises, what's the economy going to do in relation to COVID? Yeah. Getting all the right regulators into a room, all of my international counterparts have been talking about needing to speak more with Treasury, with your financial regulators, with your data regulators to understand quickly who can do what and to advocate for the role of your tool, but not over-promise where your tools don't go to something that's for someone else. Absolutely. I, I think, Dave, just turning to you with the large and conspicuous roulette wheel, the soft skills that you need to regulate domestic and international gambling and, and associated issues, are they pretty much transposable? They're the same for international and domestic or markedly different? What do you say to that? I think... Um... I mean, we're very, I mean, this is all very new for the New Zealand gambling regulator around online um, regulation because we're a little bit behind where other countries are shifting to. But one of the things, so we're very heavily reliant on research around the behaviours of gamblers when there's, they're given a couple of different sort of consumer offerings. Um, one of the things, and I pick up on what Antonia said earlier, is that, um, that the trust model people have when they walk into a... Um, into a land-based gambling area, they you know they're, they're with the they're with the cashier and they're with the sort of the gambling operators. Sometimes they're transposing that trust to the online gambling environment, um, and the online gambling environment is much like any sort of um, website or especially these international ones. You have no idea who's at the other end of the screen yeah. or what their what their ethics are or what their morals are. And a lot of the a lot of companies um, are setting up very quickly because they see money. In online gambling because of the uh, because of the growth in it. So, um, from a re international from a regulatory perspective, it's really difficult to understand um, what the best model is and what a good standard is. And the research has shown that um, by regulating domestically, you're not controlling the market; you're shifting the market. So people actually shift from the unregulated sites to the regulated sites because there's a uh, inference of trust. If it's regulated, then you can trust it. So it's really important for uh, the regulator to make sure actually that's that's a real thing, and that actually the standards and requirements they put on the operator, um, that that you know that that trust that is actually there, and that they're actually protecting the consumer. So um, I know there's some international standards around gambling around around harm minimization and sort of how the game works and and sort of the behaviours, but. Um, it's a very um, delicate field, and a lot of um, a lot of research is required to understand what's good for the New Zealand context. Because the New Zealand gambler is no doubt different to an international gambler. So, what does it mean for us, uh, and and sort of how we allow people to trust the regulations that we're putting in place? That's helpful, Dave. And and I think just just riffing off that, and this is the final question because time is against us. Um, last question to David, and it's a slightly provocative one. Um, from, from Mike in the audience, thinking about trying to solve the disinformation information issue, do the panel have comments on what this particular question would call regulatory failure? And is it just that governments can simply no longer regulate or at least effectively regulate? Briefly, David, what do you say to that? Um, look, I wouldn't use the term regulatory failure in connection with this because it's a loaded term, but I wouldn't uh, demur if others use that phrase in this context. The bottom line is we have massive global consortiums um, providing uh, platforms for this sort of material. 
Uh, they have policies and procedures in place that they talk about, but the evidence emerging suggests that they are not applying them. And effectively, if you look at the big picture, there is an argument that could be run that says um, there has been a failure to fully address the potential for harm in this space and let an industry essentially self-regulate in a way that they are conflicted to do properly. Because actually to address these issues robustly are expensive and run counter to their very business model in terms of um, frictionless uh, exposition of materials. So there, there is very, very fundamental questions here, which I think we're going to see more research and comment on in months and years to come in this context. I think it's a very, very fundamental and serious issue. Um, what do governments, how do governments kind of um, stand up and meet that? Uh, that reality, um, well, we, we shall see how that unfolds, but we're already seeing moves around the world um, really focused on trying to unpack this issue in terms of, first of all, addressing the information asymmetry in terms of the government regulator or you know, health authorities, et cetera, um, the, the lack of visibility that they have of the scope, scale, and reach of this mm. problem as against the very, very detailed visibility that the platforms themselves have. And there is a massive information asymmetry, even to start unpacking the, the extent and reach of the problem, need, leading on to what you can do about it. So we yep. need to address some of those very fundamental issues uh, to begin with. And I think you're mm -hmm. seeing moves around the world uh, looking at exactly that. Thank you, David. And now we must leave it. The conversations will, of course, continue. Our thanks to David, Dave and Antonia. Thank you all very, very much. And thank you, members of the audience. Uh, it is appropriate at this point to, to, to just spend a, a poignant moment of reflection. In closing, it is, of course, the 11th anniversary of Pike River. And, and I simply say in acknowledging it, it is um, fitting that there are uh, regulatory communities of practice like us who are here to discuss professionalism in regulation and to talk about regulatory practice and regulatory stewardship. Wherever you find yourselves, members of the audience, have a good weekend if you're watching us live. Stay safe, stay well. Please do tune in on Monday where the international conversations continue uh, with uh, international trend-setting conversations, but they won't have screen backgrounds like uh, David and Dave. Uh, until next time, members of the audience, take care from all of us here. Thank you and kakiteano.